All right, so unit two. Now we're talking about biology. Okay, remember that biology is a very different science from chemistry. Okay, in that the way that you would, let's say, study and prepare in biology is going to be different. All right, there's less of the skill practicing and more of the reading, memorizing, and thinking of applications. Okay, because uh, that's a lot more of what biology is going to be like. Uh, a question typically in biology would be something like, here's a situation, apply what you've learned to this situation, all right? As opposed to chemistry where it's, hey, you remember how you do reactions? Show me you still remember how to do that, all right? So it's more, more skill-based in chemistry, whereas in biology, it's, I have to know the material and think of different ways that Mr. Coderre could ask me to apply my knowledge, all right? So you need to think about that when you're reviewing your notes and, and things like that. All right, so for today, we're going to go over two things. The cell theory, okay, because just like in chemistry, we're going to start with looking at the basic unit of this science. The basic unit of biology is the cell, okay? Uh, and then we're going to look at, you know, a pretty important tool in biology for looking at cells, the microscope, because next week we're going to be doing a lab with the microscopes. Okay, so we need to know the points of the cell theory, which is a lot like the atomic theory, okay? And how they relate to living organisms. We need, need to know who contributed to the development of the cell theory. Good news there, there's a lot less people than in chemistry to do with the atom, okay? There's like four names you need to know and that's it, okay? Uh, and then recognize the implication of the similarities between plant and animal cells in terms of evolutionary relationships. So uh, we'll only briefly touch on that today, but it'll be kind of a common theme throughout the unit, okay? A plant cell like this one here and an animal cell have a lot of structures in common and that's not by accident, okay? All right, if I'm gonna consider something to be a living thing, what are some, let's say, properties that it would have to have or characteristics? Okay, so it's gotta be organic, okay. Okay, what else? Okay, so it has to exchange gases. Yeah, okay, because not everything like ventilates lungs, like fish use gills and one single-celled organisms that just diffuses across their membrane. But yeah, they got to exchange gases, okay. Right? Good? Mm-hmm. Okay, so fuel. Uh, not necessarily. A sponge is, an or is a living organism that doesn't move. Plants don't move, right? To be an animal, it would have to move. Well, even an not all animals move. Some are sedentary or, you know. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say that movement is necessarily a, a qualification. It's something that many of them show. Okay, yes and no, um, not all living things are going to react to stimuli, okay? That, like some of the really simple things may not react to, to stimuli. All right, um, so looking at these things here, okay? Um, living things have to be organic. That may or may not be entirely true, but we'll go with it. I would say 99.9% .9 would that would be true, okay? Um, or at least be made up of organic materials, like you said, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, okay? Um, exchange gases, grow, produce waste, reproduce, require fuel, nutrition, things like that. So realistically, by this list, could I consider fire a living organism? Yeah, it needs fuel. It can reproduce, right? Spark from the fire goes to a new place. I got a new fire. I know that seems a little bit technical, but it's true, okay? Produces wastes, it grows, it exchanges gases, oxygen for carbon dioxide, uses organic fuels. What do all living organisms have that fire doesn't? Cells, okay? That's the importance of the cell theory. The cell theory ensures that all living organisms actually are made up of cells and are not a chemical reaction like fire, okay? Because that's all fire is, fire is a chemical reaction, but it can behave like a living thing. If you've ever been near a wildfire, like it looks like fire's alive. Okay, it and it moves like it's alive. It's it's scary okay, if you've ever been up close to it. 
Stained gas means to, uh, as part of your metabolism, you have to have some sort of exchange of gas. So for animals, it's we take in oxygen, use it to burn fuel and release carbon dioxide. As a plant, they take in carbon dioxide, carry out photosynthesis and release oxygen, right? So there's some exchange of gases going on, right? Whether that's through lungs, gills, cell walls, cell membranes, whatever, there's still an exchange of gases going on, yeah? Okay, so the first point of the cell theory is the one that essentially eliminates chemical reactions from being living things, okay? All organisms are made up of cells, right? So it's kind of like the first point of the atomic theory, right? All matter is made of atoms. Well, all organisms are made of cells, okay? Uh, some are unicellular, so that would mean single cell, okay? And others are multicellular, right? So we got a few examples here of unicellular organisms, okay? This is... Um, actinopods, okay, actinopods typically live in the ocean. They have um, shells, essentially, that they secrete that are made of silicate. They're essentially glass, right? And they have little extensions of their cytoplasm, that's part of their cell, that can go outside of the, of the shell and catch food, and then that's how they feed, okay? Um, this is something that we see a little bit more often, okay? A paramecium. Paramecia live in, like, scummy pond water, sloughs, Okay, anything that's kind of stagnant, you'll find them living in. They're a single-celled organism that's pretty common. Okay, and obviously we have multicellular organisms like a cactus. Okay. All right, can you think of any organisms that may not apply or may not meet this qualification? All organisms are made up of cells. There may be one exception to this rule. It's a point of a lot of debate, actually, between biologists. Uh, no. no, I'm, no, that's a good answer, though. God is a good answer. Okay, um, I hadn't ever thought of that one, and I'm ashamed of that, actually. Um, but no, viruses. viruses. Okay, viruses are not made of cells. They are an obligate intracellular parasite. Okay, which means once they attach to your cell. They essentially hijack it, and they make it produce more viruses. Okay, we'll go into that a little bit later on in the unit, but um, they are not made up of cells. All they are is a shell made out of proteins and a single strand of genetic material. That is all they are. Okay, so they don't carry out any metabolism. They don't exchange any gases. They don't do any of that stuff. All they can do is attach to a cell and infect it. Okay, they can't even reproduce on their own. The only way they can, they can produce more viruses is to make a cell do the work for them, right? So in that way, there's a lot of argument as to whether they're a living organism or not. They have genetic material, which is something all living organisms have, and that's sort of their qualification. They, they can affect living organisms, and they can die. You know, you sort of have to be alive to be able to die, okay? And we know the viruses can die because hopefully our immune system makes them do that if they happen to get inside of us and make us sick, right? Now, the problem obviously with viruses is that once they get inside your body, they're hard to get rid of because they're not cells and they're really small. And unlike if you have a bacterial infection, your immune system can't go and kill the viruses. It has to kill the infected cells. Okay, Because going around and looking for individual viruses would be A, almost impossible, and B, counterproductive. Because if you miss one, all it has to do is infect another cell and that cell will produce a thousand more. Okay, so would they want to avoid that? So that's why if you ever get like the flu, okay, something like that, you get a virus, um, you just feel like swamped, right? Like you're just burned out. You're so tired, okay? And it's because your body is essentially destroying parts of itself in order to get rid of the virus, okay? It's going to kill any infected cells in order to get rid of them. Yeah, so take one for the team. You're infected. You have to die now, okay? Yeah. It's true. I mean, your body will do that. It'll sacrifice millions of cells to get rid of that virus. Okay. Second point of the cell theory. What's the cell's job? The cell's job is to carry out the basic functions of an organism. Okay. So we, we listed kind of those basic functions, right? Exchange gases, convert fuel to energy, produce waste, okay? Reproduce, all of those kind of things were all basic functions. Well, within an organism like ourselves that's multicellular, we have we obviously have organs okay, that help to do all of those jobs. But each individual cell in our body also 
has to be able to do all of those jobs. Okay? A cell should be able, if you take it out of your body, to survive on its own, as long as provide, it was provided with nutrients. Okay? It should be able to carry out all the basic functions of the overall organism on its own. Now, that's not necessarily 100% true because some of our cells are very specialized to do one job, so specialized to do that job, in fact, that they're not very good at doing some of the other ones. They have to be helped out, but that's why we're a large, complex organism. Right? We have cells that are specialized to help out other cells and things like that. Tracking, question? When cells are divided, yes. No, it's not creating cells because it's, it's taking one cell that's big, splitting it essentially in half. So I'm not creating more material. I'm taking a cell that was getting too large to properly function and making it into two nice sized cells that can function effectively. Yep. That, what I mean by that they're not, I'm not creating new cells is I don't have a cell factory in my body that's making cells. All of those cells come from the division of other cells. There's not a, like, like I say, there's not a, like a factory in your body that's pumping out cells for you. Yeah. Okay. All right. So new cells are not created. They come from the division of existing cells. Now this cell division process is a very intricate process. Okay. Lots of things can go wrong in the middle of it. Yes. I just said that a minute ago. Okay. Uh, so one of the, the most important things that has to happen before a cell can divide is it has to copy all of its genetic material. Okay. Cause all of your, your DNA, Okay, is in every single one of your cells. Okay, if I could, if I had a cloning machine, I could essentially take any cell in your body, except for a red blood cell. Okay, and I could make a clone of you if I had a cloning machine. If I had a cloning machine, I would clone myself first, and I'd make my clone do all the work, and I'd sit around on my butt. Okay. Um, but then I would have to kill him. But we, oh, now, now here's the thing to think about though. If I kill my clone, is that murder or suicide? <laughs> think about it. Okay. Probably. I don't know. It's farcical anyway because it'll never happen. But okay. So before a cell, before a cell can divide, it has to copy all of that genetic material because what your genetic material does is essentially it's a set of instructions to carry out all the basic functions. Okay? If your cell needs to produce insulin, for example, which is a hormone, okay? there's a part of your DNA that is the set of instructions for producing insulin. There's another part of your DNA that is a set of instructions for producing, um, let's say, enzymes for your stomach okay? and, and things like that. All of that stuff, everything your body needs to be able to do in order to survive or build you is encoded in your DNA. Every cell has to have that same information. All right? So the first thing that happens is the cell copies all of its DNA. So now there's a copy for each cell. All right? Then it kind of makes sure that you know organelles are fairly split. Not doesn't it's not a really rigorous thing. It's not making sure that you know this one gets one mitochondria and that one gets mitochondria because the DNA can always tell the cell how to make another one. Okay, um, but it you know essentially splits the the organelles or the parts of the cell and then the cell will split in half. Right, but if anything goes wrong during the copying of the DNA, the cell with the mistake will die. Okay. And that's, it's important that, that that process goes off without a hitch. Now, does it always go off without a hitch? No. Okay, it doesn't. All right? Stuff happens during cell division. Okay? And, and that can lead to genetic anomalies that happen within your cell. Right? Now, most likely that cell will just not function properly and die. Okay? Sometimes, though, that cell may continue to function. And it may malfunction, but live. Okay? And what can that cause? Yep, that's how cancer starts. Okay, cancer starts because the part of the cell that is supposed to diagnose that something is wrong with the cell isn't working. Okay, and so the cell just continues to grow and divide, and it actually starts to divide rapidly, more rapidly than it should. So you get a bunch of these malfunctioning copies building up together, and that's called a a tumor. Okay, a collection of these malfunctioning cells 
grows and you get like a lump, okay? And that's a tumor. That's the kind of thing that needs to be removed, okay? Now, a lot of people go, kind of start thinking at this point, well, then what's the big deal? Like it's my own cells, okay? They're not working right, but it's still just cells. Why is that bad for me? Well, if you start getting a big dense collection of cells, are they gonna use a lot of energy? Is it possible that they could, as a result of that, kill healthy surrounding cells? Yes, and that's what happens, okay? Like if you get a tumor on your liver, okay, that tumor continues to grow. Well, it's not doing the job the liver cells are supposed to do anymore, and it'll eventually destroy the healthy liver cells around it, and then that can lead to the failure of the organ. Well, some cells divide rapidly naturally, like your fing the ones in your fingernails and your hair and stuff like that. Uh, but some divide very slowly and some never divide, like nerve cells essentially never do. Um, so really the, the key to deciding when it's time to divide is size. Okay? A little later on in the unit, we're going to talk about the effect that cell size has on its ability to function and transport materials. The bigger a cell gets, the less efficient it becomes. Right? So cells like to stay small. So typically it's getting kind of big and things are getting difficult. I'm going to split in half now. Okay, kind of thing. Well, a cancer cell by definition is a cell that is no longer performing its proper function and is becoming dangerous. Yeah, essentially that's what it is. All right. It usually also means it's dividing rapidly, more rapidly than it should. Well, I mean, the dead tissue is not so much a worry, except that it's taking up space where healthy tissue could be, right? And so that's the worry is that the tumor, even though, yes, parts of the tumor may be dead, but the tumor is taking up the space where healthy cells used to be. And the bigger it gets, the more damaging that is to the tissue that's supposed to be there, right? Okay, so those are the, essentially the three points of the cell theory, okay? so. Everything's made up of, all living things are made up of cells, not everything. All living things are made of cells, okay? Cells carry out the basic functions of an organism, and that, guys, is probably the most important point, okay? Is that they carry out the basic function. That's something we come back to. It's a big theme in this unit, okay? Why do we have this cell? Why is that cell important? Because it's carrying out some basic function, okay? And then that new cells are not created, that they come, that cells are produced as other cells divide. Okay, so development of the cell theory. Calvin, put your book away. Okay, in 1665, a guy named Hook built the first microscope. Hook was a physicist. He wasn't even a biologist, okay? He developed a law that you'll learn in physics 20 called Hook's Law, which governs the force involved in the compression or stretching of springs, okay? This creation here was a lens experiment in physics, trying to see how he could alter the path of light as he passed it through differently shaped lenses. He wanted to have something to look at underneath it so that he could see what was happening to the light. Was he diverging the light? If he was, then the thing he looked at should appear bigger. Yeah, because he's blowing it up, right? Okay, so that was his idea was that he could get light to go through this, this microscope right, like this, if he had two beams, you could get them to cross, and then when they came out, okay, they would be, they would produce like this larger image. It's a terrible drawing of it, but that's essentially what he wanted it to do, okay? He would diverge the light, blow it up, be bigger, and whatever he was looking at would appear larger, okay? So, um, he sliced up a cork from a wine bottle, sliced up a piece of cork, and stuck it underneath the microscope. Now, what's cork made out of? Wood, yeah, it's a type of tree, okay? Now, most now now wine comes with synthetic corks because cork trees are actually becoming endangered. Okay, there's been some disease and stuff like that or whatever. But okay, he had natural cork at that time, so he took this cork and he sliced it really really thin and he put it under the microscope and this is what he saw. They looked like little rooms or cells in a jail. They were all kind of square. Okay, this is where the name came from. They looked like they were empty little rooms, like a cell. Okay, in, in a jail. So that's what he called them. That's in that name, obviously, has stuck, has stuck around, even though we know that, yeah, they're not empty. Okay, why did the ones he looked at look empty? 
Yeah, they were dead. Okay, all that was left was the cell walls from the original cells. Okay, because the cork he was looking at was had been harvested from the interior part of a tree long, long ago. Okay, so those cells were already dead. Right, so that he couldn't see the organelles and things like that inside. Not that he'd have been able to see a lot of detail anyway. His his microscope can only magnify 30 times, okay? Which, you know, which is enough to see interesting stuff, but not a lot of detail. The ones that we use will magnify up to 400, okay? And our first lens is 40. Okay? So we have a 40, a 100, and a 400. Okay, uh, so does that make sense there? Okay, so Hook is the guy who discovered cells. And like all great scientific discoveries, accidental. Okay? He was not in the business of looking for living things or the components of living things. He was doing a lens experiment for physics okay, at the time, which just goes to show that physics is awesome because physics always discovers the important stuff even when it's by accident. Okay. Yes, he did. Yeah, or at least the first functioning prototype. We'll say. Okay, but the most important part is that he's the one who discovered cells. Now, that led to a kind of development of technology, a rapid development of technology in terms of design of microscopes. Obviously, Hooke's design is still basically like what we use today for a light microscope. But lots of other types came along, like this one. Okay, this guy name was Anton von Leeuwenhoek. Okay, and he was using his little microscope here to look at all kinds of living organisms. It actually magnified better than Hooke's did. Right? And the reason it did was because he had a very long focal length. Okay? Um, essentially what could happen is he would put the little, whatever he was looking at on the top of this apparatus here, and the lens was right in this little hole. Right? So he would hold the, the microscope up to a, a light source, and the light source would go through the lens, or through the organism, then through the lens, and the light would project onto a screen or a wall. Okay? Well, the further away the screen or wall is, the bigger it would get. Right, so that's kind of how his worked, but he needed a really bright light source. So it wasn't like the easiest thing to use, and thankfully it didn't catch on because it was really hard to use. Um, but that's essentially how his worked. Okay. Now, he was the first person to look at living cells. Okay. Hook only looked at stuff that was dead. He looked at cork. Right. Leeuwenhoek first looked at living things. So he looked at the microorganisms that were in pond water. So he saw paramecia, amoebas, euglenas, okay, things like that. Okay. He looked at blood cells and he'd prick his finger and look at the blood cells. Okay. Got sperm cells from cattle. Don't ask me how he did that. Seems kind of brave or crazy, one or the other. Okay. Um, and his, mag his microscope could magnify up to 300 times. Okay, depending on, again, how far away could he effectively get the image on the screen to look like he could see something in it. And he was at the time of wigs, when wigs were really fashionable. Okay. Why were wigs fashionable? Uh, well, not so much that people went bald. People had to shave their heads because there was so much lice. So he wore wigs because the, the lice won't go after the hair in a wig because they want the living part of the hair. And that's not in a wig. So people would shave their heads and wear wigs because there was lots of life. Ego. Yeah, okay. I don't know. I know, I know nothing about how fashion works. Look at me, I'm a fashion victim. Okay. Like if my wife doesn't see me before I leave the house in the morning, like I would embarrass myself. Yeah. You can't wear that to school. Yeah. All right. Uh, number three, in 1839, cells were acknowledged as the units of life by these two guys, Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann, two Swedish scientists. Okay, I would know their names, just their last names, because they're the guys who came up with the original cell theory. That makes them pretty important. Okay, so here's how their research went. They did research on this hypothesis. If cells are the basic unit of life and tissue samples from organisms of all types are viewed under a microscope, then what are they going to see? Cells in everything. Okay, That was their basic hypothesis. And they looked at tissue samples from a very wide range of living organisms. Okay, That, that was animals, plants, fungus. 
okay? Uh, bacteria, right? All kinds of things. And they found that, yes, without exception, every living organism they looked at contains cells, okay? which is pretty good evidence to support a hypothesis of cells are the basic unit of life. All right, they had pretty good equipment for the time that they were working, okay? 1839, having a microscope that could magnify up to 600 times, okay? That was pretty good because obviously they were probably still using microscopes that used mirrors to reflect light through the microscope itself, right? This is before, you know, electricity is kind of everywhere and light bulbs are reliable and things like that. All right. Now, obviously, as technology has improved, okay, and microscopes have improved, um, that has allowed us to find relationships between organisms. Okay? In fact, there's a whole branch of paleontology that is dedicated to looking at microscopic fossils. Okay, micropaleontology is what it's called, right? And they are looking at fossilized microbes that are three and a half billion years old, okay? And in fact, I just read an article the other day that said that someone found evidence of a microscopic organism that was almost four billion years old, okay? That means that Earth was able to support life after only 500 million years, okay? Which is a lot um, shorter period of time than we had originally thought. Okay. Uh, we originally had figured that Earth required at least one billion years before it was even remotely habitable anywhere. Okay. Now, obviously, it would have been a much different place than it is now, okay, four billion years ago, but it, there was at least some place on it where life could get a foothold, okay, which says that life may be far more prevalent elsewhere in the universe than we think it is. All right, so if we're looking at, let's say, the cells of let's say a fish and the cells of a dog, are we gonna see some similarities? Yeah, okay, because they're related, okay? They're both vertebrates, that is, they both have a backbone, all right? They both have a dorsal hollow nerve cord, they have a complete digestive system, okay? Things like that. So yeah, their cells are gonna be similar. They're from the same branch of the evolutionary tree. What if I look at the cells of a fungus and the cells of an animal, let's say a fish? There's still going to be a lot of similarities. There's still going to be more in common than there is different, okay? Because a fungus uses the same mode of nutrition that we do and that a fish does. It consumes organic material for food, right? You ever had athlete's foot? Don't you don't have to you don't have to admit to that. Okay. If you've ever had athlete's foot or know what athlete's foot is, it's a fungus that grows on your feet. And it's itchy. And it's itchy because the fungus is eating you. Okay? It's a fungus and it's growing in between your cells. And what it's doing is it's excreting digestive enzymes, almost identical to the ones in your stomach, to digest the cells in your feet. That's why it's itchy. Okay. It's actually eating you. Pretty gross. Okay. But yeah, that's what it's doing. How many people are like, I want to scratch my feet right now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. A similar fungus grows on your head and causes dandruff. How many people want to scratch their head right now? Okay. Yeah. Okay. These are things that, that are just naturally occurring organisms, but their cells are still very similar, even though they're very different. Okay. No one would argue that, you know, a fungus and a fish look alike. They don't, but they still have a lot of stuff in common. The same could be said if I take a cell from a fungus and compare it to a cell of a plant. Okay, they're still going to have a lot of similarities, even though their mode of nutrition is different. One is photosynthetic and the other consumes other organisms for food. But they're still going to have more in common than there is different. Okay, so what does that tell us about all life on Earth? It, not only that it's similar, but... Right, they had a common ancestor. At some point, all life on Earth came from some single thing that started it all, okay? We're all related somehow, way, way back, okay? And that's the whole point of micropaleontology is to find those precursors, those earliest organisms that appeared on Earth, okay? And kind of track that, that you know, evolution through time, okay, to produce what we have now. 
No, not all. I didn't say not all cells. I said not all organisms. And by that, I meant viruses. Yes, not all organisms. I meant viruses. Well, they're not. I mean, I shouldn't have said they're not organic. They are still made of proteins, which are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. But they're not a metabolic organism, is what I should have said. They don't carry out any life processes. Well, no, I mean, a non-living thing by definition wouldn't be made of cells, right? Like a rock, right? It's not made of cells, made of minerals and things like that. So while some of the minerals in it might appear in a living organism, we're not related. Yeah. Then how would there have been what? That's a good question. Uh, and that's actually, there's a lot of research going on about that. Uh, one of the um, most accepted theories as to where like kind of organic stuff came from is that the earth's early atmosphere was made of a very different variety of gases like ammonia and carbon dioxide and like other way it was way different we'd have never survived okay in that environment when lightning goes through um, those types of gases it can produce organic molecules okay like pro like uh, you know proteins and things like that as a result of arcing electricity through those gases so that's the idea of where the first organic materials came from and that some of those managed to you know go together and and uh you know develop uh, be able to produce other materials and that life kind of slowly evolved that way right we're not saying that life magically just appeared right we know that it's a very slow process right if, especially if we're now saying it was, you know, the first life was on Earth 4 billion years ago. Well, right, it, to get to any sort of semblance of, you know, cells or anything like that was probably still another few hundred million years, right? It's a long, long time. Right? We, we look at it like it's like this, right? It's like, oh, well, we just look on the timeline. See, it was 100 million years and it was nothing. Well, 100 million years is a long time, right? A, a lot can change. You go back 100 million years here and there are dinosaurs around. Right? Like that's a long time, 100 million years. So a lot can happen in that amount of time. Question, Ellie? All right, so important to know that there's those similarities in cells and that those similarities most likely mean there was a common ancestor for all living things on Earth. Okay, and we're going to talk more about that throughout the unit. Okay, uh, skip that one. Okay, so plant and animal cells. Okay, just looking at a plant and an animal cell side by side, are there a lot of similar structures? Yeah, they, they, they both have the big purple thing. It's called a nucleus. We'll go into more detail later. Okay, um, they both have this blue stuff, endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, um, they both have these little like orange sausage-shaped deals, mitochondria. Okay, they both have a fluid that fills up the the cell called cytoplasm. They both have a membrane. Okay, they they have a lot of structures in common, and more important than structures in common, they have a lot of processes in common. Okay. How they produce proteins and things like that is the same. Okay. And the only reason that they would still be using the same processes is because those processes work and that their ancestor had those processes as well. Okay. So when we look at those cells, that tells us something. Okay. There's no way that these two things evolved separately to look so similar. Okay. It's just not as statistically likely as they came from a common ancestor who shared those. Not that I know of. That's not something I've ever checked on either. Uh, because cells can produce themselves. I mean, we've done stuff where, you know, like in vitro fertilization is kind of like that. We're producing a single cell from two cells, right? So if you combine an egg and a sperm and a jar, right, you can get, you can get an organism. You're making a cell that way. Um, we can modify cells. We do a little bit of like genetic engineering with bacteria. We put different, or with viruses and bacteria, we can change a virus so that it cuts out a certain part of DNA and makes changes a cell. It's called gene therapy, um, you know, stuff like that. But as to whether we've actually like made an artificial cell, probably, I don't know. Okay, um, microscopes, okay. Proper use of the microscope, and I'll go over a little bit more of this, well, the podcast will go over a little more of this on Monday because that's what you guys are going to get. Um, so microscopes are always carried with one hand on the arm and one hand supporting the base. You know what? I'm just going to run across the hall and get a microscope. 
Okay, that is how a microscope is carried, always with two hands, one on the arm, one on the base. And this is the arm, it is not the neck. I don't know, somebody somewhere along the way is teaching people that this is the neck, it's not a neck, it's an arm, okay? This is the arm of the microscope. Okay, a um, couple of things in terms of handling the microscopes, okay, once you have them. First off, the cords. They have basically all had new adapters wired onto them because people, when they're carrying them, don't check where the cord is, okay? So the cord's all unraveled and they're walking around with the cord dragging down below them. And then they step on the cord and they keep going. What do you suppose happens? Yeah, it rips the cord right out of the microscope if we're lucky here. That's the easiest one to replace. Or it just breaks it right off from the adapter, which is why this one has so much electrician's tape on it. Okay, so we got to make sure that they're wrapped up when we're carrying them. Okay, um, also you'll notice that this one was returned in the proper condition. That is with the smallest lens called the scanning power lens in viewing position. Okay, we always return them that way because that's the first lens that the next person is going to use. We always start with the lowest magnification in order to find what it is we're looking for and then we move up. Okay, everybody follow me there. All right. Okay, so microscopes, like we said, always return with the lowest power lens in. Okay, and when using a microscope, always start with the lowest power lens. Use lens paper to clean the lenses. There is special paper in the lab that is used to clean the microscope. Okay, it has no grit on it. It's lint free. It's all that kind of stuff so that we do not scratch the lenses. Okay, the last thing I want to see is this. Okay, A, gross. I got to put my eye there later. Okay, um, secondly, did you wash your finger before you did that? Gross. Okay. Secondly, or thirdly, sorry, um, you could have grit, even really small, on your finger. Okay. And if you do that and then you rub it on the lens, you could scratch the lens. Now I know you're thinking, well, that grit's got to be pretty small, Coder. Yeah, but what's a microscope going to do? Yeah. If you scratch the lens, what are you going to see? A big giant scratch because that's what the microscope is supposed to do. Make everything look bigger. If you have a scratch on it, the scratch gets bigger when magnified through the rest of the microscope. So always use the lens paper to clean the microscope. Okay. And don't do this either. Okay. Like use your, your sleeve or your shirt or something. Okay. That don't, don't do that. There could still be grit on your shirt. Okay. Um, so make sure that you're doing that. Now, in terms of using the microscope. Okay, so these are the parts of the microscope. Um, when you're focusing, there are two different knobs on the microscope to use. Okay, there's the coarse focusing knob, which is the big one. Okay, you can see that it moves the stage a lot. All right, so it's what we, you would use if you were using basically just the scanning power lens, maybe the low power lens. Okay, because it, it changes the focus very rapidly. All right, the fine focus knob hardly moves the stage at all, all right? So it brings things into very fine focus. So once you've got something in focus generally, then you can adjust with this to get different parts of it in focus. Or if you're on the high power lens, this is the only one you use. Because with the high power lens in place and a slide in the viewing area, if you start cranking away on this one, what could you do? Yeah, and there's a lot of torque here, okay? This is a big gear. So you could drive the high power lens through the slide which would break the slide and possibly scratch the lens. Okay, so you should only ever use the um, fine focus knob when you're using the high power lens because it's so much longer. Calvin. It basically has to be replaced. Yeah. No, I'm never gonna ask you to label the parts of the microscope. Okay, but you need to know what they are when I talk about them because I'm gonna use the proper names. Now. The microscopes that you may have used in, in junior high, especially if you were a John Paul II, those are the ones we left when we moved up here. They're junk. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, these ones are much better. That's why I bought them. Okay. Um, but you can move the slide around on, or move the stage 
with these ones with these two knobs here. So you can see that the little um, thing that holds the microscope slides, the lens clip, or the sorry, the slide clip, okay, can be moved with these, which is way better than what you would have had to do with the other ones, which is put your fingers on the slide on the stage and move the slide around with your fingers. Okay, because as soon as you do that, you push on the stage and then it goes out of focus. Okay, this way you don't push on the stage, you just move the, the slide around to see different parts of the slide with these two little knobs here. Okay, so that's pretty handy as well. Underneath the stage is what we call the condenser diaphragm. Okay, so this thing here basically just allows different amounts of light through. It's just a little iris. Okay, you can open and close it. Um, when you let more light through, um, sometimes that's good and sometimes it's not. Lower levels of light can actually make things easier to see. So oftentimes on the high power lens, you'll want to adjust that to let a little bit less light through. And then sometimes structures just jump out. Okay, you couldn't see them before because the light was so bright they were just washed out. All right, so as you decrease the amount of light, the contrast improves. Okay. On the scanning power lens, you probably want a fair amount of light. Yeah. And you can also you can also change how bright the light is with this rheostat here on the side. Okay, but this one here really helps to improve the quality and sharpness of your image. Okay. Um, also, there's a switch on the back. Okay, that turns on the light. All right, so a little on off switch and it's labeled which one's on and off. So that's good for you, okay? All right, now uh, this is something that's not in your notes, but I want you to quickly draw this diagram here, okay? This is what we're gonna talk about on Monday in terms of estimating the size of an object using the field of view of each lens. So I'll give you a minute to copy that here. Okay, so yeah, good question here. Do we need to write down this the, the numbers? Yes, you do, okay? The field of view on the scanning power or 40X lens is 4,000 micrometers, okay? This little symbol here is mu. It's the Greek letter M, and it's a U with tails. Okay, that's what it's supposed to look like, but my handwriting's awful. So that's what mu looks like, okay? The reason we can't use M for micro is we already use M for millimeters, okay? And a micrometer is a thousand times smaller, okay, than a, than a millimeter, right? So a millimeter is 10 to the minus three meters, okay? A micrometer is 10 to the minus six. Okay, so it's quite a bit smaller. Oh, I don't have it on there, it's 1600. 1600 mu m micrometers. Yeah, they're all u m. Yeah, or mu m. Yeah, micrometers, micrometers. Hmm? No, they all. No, no. This is mu. This is m. Micrometers, right? Just like centimeters. Right? The m is for meters. How do you spell it? Yeah. M-U. Yeah. Okay, so here's what we get, need to sort of understand about what happens when we look through a microscope. When I look through the scanning power lens, I have the least magnification, but the largest viewing area. Okay, as I increase the magnification, I decrease the viewing area because I'm magnifying more and more, so I'm seeing less and less space, but more and more detail. Everybody follow me there? Okay, so it gets down to the point where when you're on high power, you've gone from having 4,000 micrometers as a viewing diameter to 400 micrometers as a viewing diameter, All right? Now, are you seeing a lot more detail? Yes, but you're not seeing as much area, okay? The idea here is we wanna start with the scanning power lens to find what it is we're looking for because we can see a wide area, okay? Uh, and then once we've found that object, we'll move the stage so that it's in the middle, and then we'll move up to the next magnification. Why would I wanna do it that way? Right, so I can zoom in on it. If I don't move it to the center, is there a possibility I won't see it when I move up? Yeah. Yes, okay. When you're looking through the lens, okay, um, what you'll see is this. So you'll see a big circle, and you'll see a black, it looks black, but it's actually brass. Um, pointer. Okay, It's supposed to be there. It tells you where the center is. I once had a group who brought three microscopes to me telling me that they were broken. I'm like, what is wrong with them? Well, there's this big black thing in it. So I looked through, I'm like, 
What big black thing? Look, this thing right here. That's the pointer. It's supposed to be there, okay? So don't worry. That big black pointy thing is the pointer, and it's supposed to be in there, okay? Every time you find what you're looking for, move it to the end of the pointer so that you know it'll still be centered, or close to center at least, when you move up to the next magnification. If you don't, if I'm looking at something on scanning power and it's out here, when I move to low power, it's not going to be there anymore. I won't see it, okay? It's outside of the field of view. So we always want to center it before we move up, okay? All right. If I want to estimate the size of something, let's say I'm estimating the size of this object. About how big is that? Let's, yeah, about 1,000, maybe 1,200 micrometers. How do we do that? Yeah, we just figured out about how many of them would fit across, right? It looks like maybe about four, maybe a little less than four would fit across. That means that each one's about 1,000. Okay. No, in diameter. Okay. And we always measure along the object's longest dimension. Okay, Whatever dimension is longest, that's the one we use to measure. All right. But it's just an estimation. I'm not expecting you to calculate and show decimals. All right. Have a good weekend, guys.